If we can take our seats so I can bring Dr. Gigi back up. I need to put a little disclaimer here of what I mentioned before in this so-called business of religion. It was very schematic to say, okay, when you pick up at that time, this is not Christianity today and it's not Christianity 500 years ago. That was the very early stage where we're talking about two kinds of people in that world, pagans and Jews. Pagans, simply idol worshippers. They and Jews formed the early Christianity by accepting Yeshua, Jesus, as the Savior and accepting the foundation of faith at the time. So when it was offered to them, it was not offered to good Christians like Judaism 50% off. It was offered to pagans and say, take it and you don't have... And what, why is the issue is not accepting it in 100%? Because it's impossible. Because people coming from a background, they did not come from a vacuum. People already had... Um, the danger of the, to the believers, even to the Jewish believers at the time there in Ephesia and Corinthia and Galicia and all those places in Greece, in the islands there, the danger was that they are losing even their Jewish faith to the faith, just like ch ch looking for new truths, quote unquote, and they are getting a lot of the theologies from the East, from Ishtar, Ashtoreth, and the other goddess and gods from the East. And that was this, there was such an urgency to get the message, the word across very quickly to capture the heart of people and bring them back home to safe haven that was actually the faith. And this is not 50% off not to Christian, but it was 50% off that Christianity in the beginning to those who were pagans. Just get in, put your foot at the door. It doesn't really mean that everything needs to be done to be 100%. No, things change with time. We don't sacrifice anymore and this is part of the Bible so that means we don't need to do that rule and there's many other things that the grace gave people a great gift that they don't need to follow everything but it, again I just stay with the Hebrew and these questions that are theological questions are better to be asked and addressed to pastors and spiritual leaders that are much better knowledgeable than I am in this subject I just did it schematically to show that there was a melting pot at, at, at certain time of history, they were offered something and they couldn't take the whole thing because they're already doing a lot of things that are different. It was very hard to jump into a faith and to say, okay, do just part of it, but be in, Dra be grafted in. And that was good that it happened that way because the development led to the good things after. That's basically the idea. Not saying that everything needs to be kept and I'm not really a leader in that sense at all, so I can't say to people what to do. Going back to uh, <clears throat> that important part that we were talking about, um, the four Rosh Hashanahs, the four beginnings of the year. I don't know what's more powerful than the other. Let's do, let's do, let's leave that around for a second and talk about the handout that you have. There, and I, I mentioned that there is some very big, serious teaching that is coming from the New Testament and it sheds light on Hebrew expression that you cannot find in the old for, for in that case. We all know in English, we're speaking about, and I put several verses there, all the verses that speaks about one word in the Bible, in that everybody has the hand out there, you do? On the very beginning, when it says Galatians 4, right? Um, verse 19, and I, I put also the transliteration, you can do it in Hebrew, it says, Yeladai od ha'pa'am chevle leida yochazuni alechem, Ad asher yutzar b'chem ha-Mashiach. That's what it says. And my little children, of whom I am again in travel until Christ is formed in you, or Messiah will be, is formed in you. The emphasis here is on the word chevle leida. The coming of the Messiah is not something happy and easy and simple, and it's going to happen one morning, we turn on the TV, and the newscaster will say, oh, well, good news here, than that. besides the weather, Messiah has arrived, and if you want to meet him, just go downtown there, and he's, you know, no. The coming of Messiah is going to coupled with very severe, serious magnitude 
of forces and events that are beyond imagination. Only a few people in this audience, well, about a half, already experienced something of the coming of the Messiah. And this group, special group of people that are sitting right here in front, Jeff, you're not among them. <laughs> Craig, you too, you're not. You're not experiencing it. You too, you're not. That group of people are women. <clears throat> they experience something that has to do with Messiah and men have not. But not every woman, every woman, only those that already gave birth. So you're in. <laughs> and the word dear here that we see is Chevlei Leida. Now, Chevlei Leida, interestingly enough, and it's figuratively, and it's very pictorial, that word is very pictorial, doesn't just mean the pain of birth. And of course, you know what that means, right? Women that gave birth. We cannot even talk about it, we just, uh, only from rumors, you know. <laughs> Oh, wives, yeah, right. Uh, but the word I want to emphasize, the main issue here is the word chevlei. Chevlei comes from the Hebrew word chevel. And chevel in Hebrew means a rope, a cord. And interestingly enough, that word in the Bible appears only in four references. The number one reference, the main one, is birth. Chevlei leda. So when we refer to that as a translation, yes, we say, many words are used to be said. The passion of Christ, the agony of that. The, the, you know, they're using those words, but they are less than the full meaning of the word. The full meaning of the word is the umbilical cords of birth. That folds in the entire picture which I'm going to phrase in that way. The pain and agony one needs to endure to bring forth the following. If it's birth, is the pain and agony one needs to endure to bring forth birth. And women can testify for that. It's big pain and agony. Men sometimes cannot even, never can really fully understand what that means. But it comes with joy and great happiness because you know what is coming. The baby is coming, and women will go and endure this pain, and it's deep pain. I mean, as much as I heard, even my, my wife, my ex-wife told me that when my daughter said, this is, you can never imagine this pain. This is very strong pain and agony. And look at that. This is the birth. This, and there are some, there's one example here. I found it. I did not find it in, in Old Testament. But it's used even today. In the regular Hebrew, we use the word chevlei leida. The deep pain and agony one needs to endure to bring forth birth. The second one is from the very other extreme, the other side of birth, and that's death. And this one appears in many places. Look at Luke 22. V'cha'asher afafuto chevlei mavet itpalel bechoska. Somebody wants to read the English out loud, nicely. Being, who is, who is a good English? Who? Jeff. His microphone is on. Can we put his mic on for a second? Okay, Jeff, read for us, please, that verse in English. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Love your voice. Wow. That sounds biblical. Great. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This is very good. So, the word here that they're using in the English is what? What is the word for chevlei mavet? They're using a softer term. Is what? Agony. agony. Just the agony. But the truth is that the Bible verse here speaks about the umbilical cords of death. Just as much as it is explained in birth, it is the same word in death. Meaning is much greater than just pain and agony. It's a process, or if you want to rephrase it again, pain and agony one needs to endure to bring forth the coming 
And this is death. Chevlei mavet. Not just a quick shot, even though it can happen instantaneously from the spectator from the sides, it's not instantaneous. And this is a hint in the Bible that this is a process just like birth. Umbilical cords of death. And it's not only there. Look at the next verse, the Acts 2. Ve'elohim hitir chevle ha'mavet v'ikimehu min ha'metim. This have an even greater uh, support to what I'm saying here. Ve'ikimehu min ha'metim ki ha'mavet lo atzar koach l'achzik bo. Jeff, please. Whom God raised up, having freed him from the agony of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Okay, having freed him here, again, is a little weaker than the Hebrew. Free could be what? Just let open the door for him or anything. In the Hebrew, hitir, the word hitir means to un... What's the... When you're tied up. When you, yes, it's free generally, but it's unwrap? Unbound. Unbound. Unbound means just take a wire, a rope and unbound you. This is the word used here in Hebrew, very pictorial. So that word that he was already wrapped up with the umbilical cords of death, and God didn't just freed him from that, he unbound him, physically went and opened up those umbilical cords of who knows what it means. We haven't been there if we were here. But that's basically what happens there. This is what the Bible says, but it's not only there. The next verse, Hebrews 2, says, אבל רואים אנחנו את יהושע ההוא, אשר חסרו מעט מאלוהים, ויעטרהו כבוד והדר עקב חבלי המוות, אשר עפפו הוא, כי בחסד אל טעם טעם המוות בעד כולם. ג'ף, פליס. But we see him who has been made a little lower than the angels, Yeshua, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he should taste of death for everyone. Once again, a very strong word in Hebrew. Afafu has double, double meaning. It's more than just being wrapped, Chevle Amavet. But it's also like you are embraced by a cloud, by covered up in some kind of a mist or something like that. Afaf means being covered, like when you see sometimes a halo or, or a mist around someone. Even the pictures of the ancient time still showed it. Yes, they are Catholic, but those are more or less describing what he was surrounded by. The rope of the umbilical cord of death and that kind of a mist or some kind of a cloud that is surrounded with. But that's not the only place. There is one more. And this is taking us to where? To, we did actually, we, we did Hebrews 2, right? Yes, to Psalm 116. Psalm 116, it's jumping here on my computer. Okay, Psalm 116. And it says, Afefuni chevle mavet umetzare sheol metzauni tzara veyagon emtza. And Jeff again. The cords of death surrounded me, and the pains of Sheol seized me. I found trouble and sorrow. And here we find, metzare sheol, we find the word correctly. Here they speak about the cords, not just the pain or agony, but actually it's being called chords here, actual chord. And the next one in, in Psalm 18 is very same verse that you will find later on or earlier on, but I can't move this computer, I don't have the, okay, let me see. Uh, we are in what? In Psalm 18, right? And the next one is what? Is a... Something stuck in my computer. Okay. The next one is from where? 
No, there is one more there in the same, right? In verse 6 is the same, from the same, from the same chapter. Verse 6 says, and here is the third one that is being introduced with the word chevlei. There aren't too many, very few words refer to the umbilical cords, and each one of them is more as powerful as the other. But the new, the new thing is will be the very last one here. Here he speaks about chevlei sheol savevuni kidmuni mokshei mavet. Jeff, please. The cords of sheol surround me. The snares of death took me by surprise. So not only birth and not only death has umbilical, cor umbilical cords, but also that place that is called the Sheol. We talked about it yesterday. It's some kind of a hell, or who knows how to call it. We don't know exactly, but we call it in Hebrew Sheol. It's something under, below. That's another word of grave magnitude, just like birth and death. And also the Sheol has the umbilical cords. Okay, the next one is now giving us the hope. And look at this. The next one says in Colossians 1, and this is Paul speaking. And then in, in the, oh, the same one, by the way, I'm skipping it because uh, 2 Samuel 22, this King David speaking, and he says exactly the same words that you find in Psalms 18 there, in number 6, right? Exactly the same words sp spoken there. But in Colossians 1, Paul speaking, and this is the great contribution to the knowledge of the world, including the knowledge of the Hebrew people of the world, that this word we're using today in Israel, actually there are very famous songs in Israel speaking about that word. And he says, Go ahead, Jeff, please. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and fill up on my part that which is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the assembly. The English is falling short of comprehending the full magnitude of the word chevlei. It's not just the affliction of Christ. It is the umbilical cords of Mashiach, of the Messiah. And it's equated here, as you can see, to the same magnitude as death, as birth, death, even Sheol, which is the worst place on earth, and the coming of the Messiah. I.e., the coming of the Messiah is not something that will be taken easily. There will be announced one morning, and this is Messiah, this is it. It's going to be coupled with the umbilical cords equivalent, which means, in other words, they understood from that one thing, the affliction, the pain, but they did not understand the whole thing of being wrapped around the whole process of birth and death, and Sheol is coupled in his coming. In other words, the pain, suffering, and agony one needs to endure. And who is the one? You! And you, and you, and you, and every one of us needs to endure for coming of the Messiah. So it's not going to be leaning back, reclining on our sofa, flipping TV and say, oh, look at that, what they say in Seattle News tonight, Messiah is right there in the dome and he's making announcement at 9 p.m. It's going to be a big magnitude, and this is Hevle Mashiach. It's going to be coupled with the umbilical cords that leads pain, suffering, and agony. Not of him. He already did that. He already paid with the pain, suffering, and agony. It's ours. But he's still saying, I'm happy now in my, in a, in my, in my suffering, right? Rejoice my suffering because, in, and he's taking the, the pain as a joy. Because the same thing will, do, will the mother do. She will take the pain with joy, knowing that she will have the baby. And the people, everyone that is waiting for salvation and for the Messiah to come, will need to prepare the heart, Sue, prepare the heart by thinking and feeling that the, this preparation is being going to be coupled with pain, suffering, and agony to bring forth the coming of the Messiah. And that takes us to the next verse here, which is 
Very interesting. Let's not let's skip that one. Let's go to the very last. No. Yeah, let's go to the one which is First Peter 1. ויחתרו לדעת מתי ואיך יבוא המועד אשר הודיעם רוח המשיח אשר שכן בקרבם כאשר הגיד להם מראש חבלי המשיח והכבוד אשר בעקבן. ג'ף פליז. Searching for who or what kind of time the spirit of Christ which was in them pointed to when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow them. Once again predicted the pain, agony and suffering of the umbilical cords of the birth of Mashiach. You see, it's like a birth. It's not just an another day, another event. It's like a birth. It's like death. To that grave magnitude the word is. The next verse here, not the next verse, we go to one before, and this is leading us to the strong subject that I want to cover here. Luke 23, <coughs> verse 2 says, ויחלו לסיתנו, לסיתנו לאמור, מצאנו את האיש הזה מסלף את עמנו ומשגה אותם מטט מס לקיסר באומרו כי הוא המלך המשיח. ג'ף, go ahead please. They began to accuse him saying, we found this man perverting the nations, forbidding paying taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king? Wrong, 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 wrong. Should I say it again? Not is Christ a king. What is a king? A, 15 of the same kind, 15 of the same value, 15, 15 or 19 or 20 of the same power. No, a king. The expression in Hebrew for Messiah is King Messiah. King then is not a king, just an accidental someone that is a king joining a group of others. Is the king. Melech, or it says in Hebrew, the Hebrew is fine, the English is wrong. It says, ha melech, ha mashiach. And we know it in Hebrew, it's part of the Hebrew language. Melech, ha melech, ha mashiach, the king, the messiah. We, we don't say the king, the messiah, but the definite article in Hebrew is followed across, even if I want to say the good boy, I would say literally the boy, the good, right? Twice. Ha yeled, ha tov. Ha is the, tov is good. If I want to say the good boy, yeled is boy, I would say ha yeled to make it definite, and I would say ha tov, the good. The boy, the good. What do you see here? Ha melech, Hamashiach means king, the king Messiah, the king Messiah, not a king Messiah, the king Messiah, the one. And the last one I'm going to do very quickly because it's less of the power of this one, but it's, a, it's in 2 Timothy 1, and it says, לכן אל, ולכן אל תבוש מעדות אדוננו, ולא ממנו אסירו, רק נשא חבלי הבשורה כמוני בגבורת אלוהים. ג'ף? Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but endure hardship for the good news according to the power of God. So, this is another attachment to the word chevlei, the umbilical, cord, the umbilical cords of the good news, of telling the good news, the besorah in Hebrew, which is basically the same word for the gospel. The word gospel is besorah. So they are touching that word, which is equivalent to death, to birth, to death, to Sheol, to the Messiah, to the good news. And this is in 2 Timothy. Now tell me, you can't find that information in the Old Testament. You see part of that that relates to the umbilical cords of death, but there's apparently umbilical cords of the gospel. Is it easy to come and carry the gospel? Is everybody accepted just like that? No, there are birth pains to go and accept the gospel. You know how many people got killed just because they wanted to accept it? This is very close to life, that, to, to birth, death, Sheol, and the coming of Messiah. But the most powerful statement here is HaMelech HaMashiach. And why is it so? We jump back to where we started talking about the four Rosh Hashanahs. So we speak about the, the one that is Rosh Hashanah that just happened. Well, we'll talk about the year, right? So we didn't finish that. But there are a couple of more months. They're not so important. I'll save the time. Um, 
They are important, but we, we just don't have to do it right now. You're not remember the, name, the names anyway, so we can skip that. But all those months are not Hebrew. Only three of them are Hebrew, and they relate, each one of them is related to another month. But remember, the Tishrei is really not the first month. The first month of the year is the month of Nisan. That is the month of Passover. This is the month of, if you want, the early salvation. Salvation, coming out from being slaves in Egypt, becoming free people. The freedom, the first freedom. This is where we celebrate the new year. But let's, let's not get there yet. This is the first of the month, right? There is always, there are two school of thoughts. Bet Hillel, the house of Hillel, and the house of Shammai during the time. The Pharisees and Sadducees at the time of uh, Yeshua and after. And um, they're, they're debating about the dates, exactly. Well, let's cover the other two and get to the important one. There is Rosh Hashanah to the trees. We discussed that one. It's coming on the 15th days of the month of Shvat. And uh, that holiday is when we do the planting and we send uh, plants to Israel and people even sometimes can do it here and they will plant an, a tree in Israel. And in Israel, the kids plant trees. I remember the specific tree I planted when I was third grader in a place in Israel and I drove back like a year and a half ago and said, I want to see it, but I remember the spot where I was standing in, a, in, in relation to the building and I went back and it was so big. It was a big, huge tree. I said, wow. And I was holding this little thing and planting it. It was on that holiday, on the 50th, 15th of Av, I mean, 15th of Shvat, uh, when I was third grade. It was not, didn't happen really in the fifth century, just a few years ago. <laughs> so um, the, important, the importance of, and then the next one, of course, is the Rosh Hashanah that we celebrate here. Ten days before the Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur then is the Day of Atonement. And people ask, well, why do we need to do this Yom Kippur? Aren't we free from the sins because we accepted Yeshua? And I did hear a very, by the way, remark in one of the cities of Pastor Mark Biltz. He explains it very well. No, you're not really free. And accountability is something I was pretty happy to hear that because the teaching was like very thorough. I think I called him up right after that. You know, so I was, mm. It was a Bible, by the way, statement. It's in the, it's going to be in his book, um, the, the Bride, Spots, Wrinkles, and Blemishes. I think it's there. Uh, I need the verse here to lead us into there. Okay, just give me, okay, right here. I got it. So, the next Rosh Hashanah is the Rosh Hashanah that is celebrated on the month of Tishrei, which is not the first month, it's the seventh month. If you, count, if you start counting it from the months of Nisan, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, Tammuz, Av, Elul, that's six, and Tishrei is the seventh month, even though we treat it as the beginning of the year in Israel, but it's the seventh month according to the Bible. Uh, that holiday, that Rosh Hashanah, is not Rosh Hashanah only for people. It's called Rosh Hashanah Lashanim, Lashmitin, Layovalot, Lanetiyah, Layorakot, which means this is a Rosh Hashanah for the years. We're counting years from that day on. And it is from the Shemitah, which is what in, in, in English, Frank? Like uh, Shemitah, mm, what, what's the word? Jub no, 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 no. Shemitah is not Jubilee and it's not seven. Sh okay, well, I'll give it to you in other words and you'll know what I mean. Shemitah is like you owe me an amount of money and after so and so years I have to drop it. It's not done only in Jubilee. It's done in different ways too. This is what? Bankruptcy comes with com indentured service. That's right. And bankruptcy is very much biblical because what do you do? This is Shemitah. And there is other rules there in the Bible. But the Shemitah is also is what you do what you don't do when you stop working on the field on the seventh year you're not abusing the land and so on and then it has to do with the jubilees too the yovalot what you call the yovalot jubilee yovel it's the same thing all the j's are yeah in hebrew la netia also for plantation of different things and la yorakot and also for the fruit for the for, no sorry for the vegetables not the fruit the fruit has to do with the other holiday, with the two bishvat, too, the fruit. 
So what is the difference between fruit and, and the vegetables? You has to do, it has to do with tithing. Because at that time, they were tithing all parts of what they did, you know, the first, first fruit of Zion, right? But the first fruit of Zion really belongs to God, not only for the first year, but for the three years. Certain things for the three years, vegetables on the first year belongs to God, right? Only then it's yours. And um, so this is the Rosh Hashanah that we know and we celebrate and we say Happy New Year. This is Rosh Hashanah, but it's in the seventh month. What really happens, and it's pretty perplexing, is the fourth Rosh Hashanah. And this is, of course, Rosh Hashanah la melachim ve la regalim. This is Rosh Hashanah for the kings and for the feasts. The three, the regalim. You know, what is those feasts in Hebrew? You see, the English doesn't really, doesn't really explain what's the meaning of that. Regalim coming from the word regel. A foot. And regel, and what is a pilgrim in Hebrew? What's the word pilgrim? Pilgrim in Hebrew is aliyah la regel. Ascending by foot means pilgrim. You see the picture? People went to walk up to Jerusalem. That's why it's aliyah. They didn't go to Tiberias. They didn't go to the Dead Sea. They went up to Jerusalem. They ascended to Jerusalem. And that's the, the three feasts that they had to walk up to Jerusalem. Even the word habit came from the word foot. Hergel, hergel. Well, it's a customary thing. You, it's like a foot, following all the time. The same step, up, 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 becomes a habit. Foot is pilgrim, pilgrimage, and so on. So the holiday of uh, Rosh Hashanah, that Rosh Hashanah for the kings, is the holiday also for the feasts. They start counting the feasts from that, feasts from that day. So far, so good. But what is really Rosh Hashanah la Melachim? What, what is the new year for the kings? The kings of Israel needed to be crowned in a certain day. According to the biblical, some research, it's not, we don't know it from the Bible exactly, but they said that they start counting, well, let's say somebody was crowned on the second month. So whatever was left from that day to the month of Nisan, which is the first month, remember, even though it's not the beginning of the year, it is the beginning of the year for the king of Israel. This is a day of crowning of the kings of Israel. So even if one was kind of becoming a king on the third month, and the time that is left until uh, Nisan, some claim it's the first of Nisan, some say the 15th of Nisan, is considered to be the first, king, the first year of reign. But the crowning was probably done on that day. So all that is still very, very beautiful. But what that has to do with us today? We finished the verses before with the statement that Yeshua, that the Savior is Melech HaMashiach, King Messiah. So show me a king that is a king that was not crowned. Where was he crowned? And how can the king reign without being... And you know, crowning is a very... It's a symbolic thing, but it needs to take place because without crowning, there is no kingdom. You can't just step in and, hey, I'm a king here. It needs to be crowned. And the symbol of crowning is a very important step to usher the king into the kingdom. And the king cannot claim the kingdom without being crowned. So we know that kings are crowned in different times. Sometimes after the death of another king, they become king, but they are crowned on the days of Rosh Hashanah. They are counting their kingdom from that day. They start reign. They start to reign. Look at a strange coincidence in history. The departure of Jesus, Yeshua, from this world happened to be on that month of Nisan, we know it for fact, right? New Testament shows it, it's in Nisan. And we know also that was something around the Passover time because there was the Last Supper, which we know already that was the Seder, right? That big meal that we're doing Passover. So what that has to do with crown? Where is the crown there? We have a mutual friend, Frank and I, have a mutual friend, his name is Pastor John Higgins from Arizona. He's from a Calvary. 
And I shared with him that teaching, and he was very excited because he was going then on national television and said, I'm going to share that on television. That, that's cool. That's really good. I love that. Then I told him more that we're going to share here. And, um, and I told him, this is the day of crowning the kings, and look what happens. Okay, so now put things together here. King Messiah, not just Messiah, crowned, needs to be crowned, right? What happened just there a few minutes before the crucifixion? Just a short time before. You got it. Those ignorant Roman soldiers put a crown of thorns on his head to mock him. This is a mockery. This is an act of mockery, but it really it mockery for men, but it's a mandatory act for the crowning. For God, it's not mockery. Just like Balaam was standing there to curse, and he stands there and it cursed became the great blessing. Hallelujah. So he, he is there now. You understand the meaning of the crowning on the thorns there? This was mandatory, necessary step to usher into the kingdom because without that, there is no kingdom. The kingdom is not complete. And we know, I showed it to you here, it's not my invention. It's Hebrew, Pastor Art, in the New Testament that shows Melech HaMashiach, the King Messiah. So let's have some respect for the Hebrew of the New Testament much more than what we imagine. Okay. And it's a, it's, it was a revelation for me too. I mean, I said, I'm going to learn Hebrew from the New Testament. You know how I met Frank Sikens? This is so embarrassing. I'm, I'm repenting until today for 24 years. Every day, I say, forgive me. I said, Danny, I forgave you 24 years ago. I, mean, I had no respect for this. I mean, I'm sitting in a class. Frank Sikens sits there, class of pastors, modest men. I mean, you know, I don't notice him. I'm an Israeli, arrogant, you know, sorry, you know, conceited. I'm fighting against it. I'm not conceited when I talk to people, but my heart, Sue, my heart was like, hey, 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 you know. So Frank approaches me there, Frank Sickens, and show me his book, Hebrew Word Pictures. And I said, would you like to take a look at that? And I said, sure. And my heart says, who, who do you, what is this? And I said, oh, teaching Hebrew. And I look at him and say, are you Jewish? He said, no, I'm not Jewish. And my heart and my mouth said, oh, very nice. But my heart says, who do you think you're going to teach me Hebrew here? But my mouth said, I'll take a look at that. But my heart says, I'm never going to even look at this, you know. But my mouth said, Frank, thank you so much. I'll check it in. You know, liar. You know, I'm going home. I'm going home. He sees me a week after. He said, did you look at that? I said, not yet. And my heart said, gee, and you think, you're you going to teach me Hebrew? What, what, you know. And the week after, he asked me, very, just in the end, he just approaches me as a gentle man and did you look at it? I said, I'm working on that. I did work on that. I moved it from one shelf to the other, you know. <laughs> Didn't touch it. And when we finished this class in Living Streams, Frank Sickens, he's going to teach me Hebrew. He grew up in an Indian reservation. He, well, I did, I'm Israeli, you know. He approaches and he says, I'm sure you have dinner sometimes. I say, I'm do. So do you mind if I'll take you? To, this is the last session. I, would not, I know you didn't touch my book. Oh, well. Would you mind to have dinner with me? I will never forget this lentil soup. It's stuck in my throat until this very day, twice. And we sit down in this restaurant, and I have the lentil soup. I'm relaxed and said, you don't trust me, right? I said, well, I, 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 I trust you, but my Hebrew, you don't really trust us. Oh, well, you know, my heart says, of course not. Oh, anyway, what do you know Hebrew? <laughs> my mind said, you know, Frank. And Frank says, well, ask me a word that you know that I don't know. And so, oh, he's going to challenge me like this here. So with the lentil, the lentil soup, just did it, and I wrote the word hatred on a piece of paper, and I gave it to him, like, oh, oh take it, you know, swallow that stuff. And, I, and he said, then it has to do with deep hatred. And I, <coughs> what did you say? And I, that's a mistake. That's a coincidence. Let me give you another one. I'll get another one. He looks, and he said, that has to do with glory. I said, this is it for the soup, you know. What? How did you do that? What, what is this? What, how? You don't know? Are you sure? Not, not, I'm not Jewish. I, I really am not Jewish, Frank. I'm, you're telling me. So how do you do that? Uh, I, you know, I didn't, uh, we stayed it until they kicked us out. Then I got home and I called him right away. and said, listen, I opened this book and I see here. And every day I would consult with him. He said, show me what's the picture of this one. And he would share everything. 
But the modesty that this man had was really what captured me, and my arrogance was so bad, and I, I keep asking me, do you forgive me? I said, Danny, that was 24 years ago, I forgive you. <laughs> but I still hope that he, I do forgive me, Frank. <laughs> the crowning of the king, it was a mandatory step that needed to be taken place and the pastor that I shared it with, the John Higgins, was about to go to television the next morning and share it. You know, he was very excited. And he calls me up in the evening and he said, Danny, you said that this Rosh Hashanah Lamlachim, this new year for, the new year for the kings, happens on Nisan. This is really when our Messiah was crucified. And I need to know where, where, where is that in the Bible that they are crowning the kings on that day? And I thought, well, no problem. I mean, I've got to find it in the Bible. It's Hebrew. I mean, you know. So I'll call you up and say, I need to go to sleep really early. I don't mind. If you don't mind, call me early. I said, sure, I'll call you early. So like 7 o'clock, I get home. I thought, well, five, six minutes, I'll find it. So I start flipping the page. I can't find it. So I look again. I said, okay, now I need to do it systematically. I start reading Genesis. He calls me up. I said, Danny, I need to go to sleep. I said, I know, I know. But tell me where it's in the Bible. I cannot, I cannot just go like this to... Um, television and Christian and, and not find the substantiation. How do we know that the kings were crowned on that day? I mean, I just can't. I'll tell, I'll tell you. I'll find it. Midnight or 1 a.m. I still cannot find it. I read it cover to cover from Genesis up to Deuteronomy. I can't, you know, I can't find it. Numbers. I read the whole thing and speed reading and slow reading and dissecting it. Early morning before he goes to television, I called the chief rabbi of this area and I called him up. I said, Help me out. He said, what? I, said, I didn't tell him. I said, somebody needs to go on television. I shared something. How do we, Rabbi, how do we know, in an orthodox way, how do we know that our king, the kings of Israel, need to be crowned on Passover, on that day? And said, Danny, it's in the Talmud. I said, Talmud? <laughs> I can't go to the pastor and tell him it's the Talmud, and he will go to Christian television and tell them Talmud. And, he's, and he, Rabbi is reprimand me. He said, Danny, what, what, what do you think? What do you think? The Talmud is just a made-up stuff. If it's in the Talmud, it's substantiated in the Bible. I said, where? So I'm asking you, ask me, how do we know that the kings of Israel are crowned on Passover? Ask me. I don't know. I do know. I do, I do know because the Rabbi told me. I do know. So it is, but I need to give you the verse because otherwise I'll be just like me pulling the leg of the pastor. So it will be, it is, found it. <coughs> pastor Mark Belt quoted the same verse here when you're talking about the bride, about King Solomon starting to build the temple only in the fourth year of his reign all this time before that he's accumulating wealth and that, that, that's Pastor Bill's teaching. I don't touch that. But the same verse, it is in 1 Kings 6, verse 1. I read it in Hebrew. Vayihi b'shmonim shana v'arba me'ot shana l'tzet b'le Yisrael me'eretz Mitzrayim b'shana ha-revi'it b'chodesh ziv hu ha-chodesh ha-sheni limloch shlomo Al Israel vayiven habayit l'Adonai. Jeff, you have the speaker there, microphone? Oh, you don't have that. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, okay. <laughs> All right. So, and it came to pass that in the 400, in the 418th year, okay, uh, after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziv, which is the second month, month that he began to build the house of the Lord. If that is, that month of Ziv is the second month. Yes, we can't find it. It doesn't tell us anywhere that he starts reigning in the month of Nisan. We don't really know it in the Bible. But here comes a man. His name is Bartanura from Italy. And he spent most of his life just finding things that are in the Talmud and they are not off the air, but they are connected very closely to the Torah. This is one of them when the, when the truth is hiding underneath the layer. 
Yes, we don't know that he was crowned in that month, but we know that the month of Ziv, which is the month of Iyar, just one month before Nisan, before Nis so if that's Iyar, Ziv, and that was the second month of his reign, means that he was crowned a month before, right? If that's the second to his kingdom, what it says here, then the month of Ziv is the month of Iyar, and the month before that is the month of Nisan. So here is a solid, strong proof that the king, and then you find it in other places too. It says, and it came to pass in the five mo fifth month of the reign and so and so, and you cross-check it and you find out, aha, that's the truth. It is not straightforward said, but you can infer it from the writing. That's a great thing that's, part of, that's in the Talmud. No, not all of that is bad. It's fabulous stuff. So now we know he's crowned on the day of crowning the kings of Israel. This is a proof. And he is crowned on the actual crown. And on the plaque above his head, it says, Yoshua Nutsri Melech Hayudim. What did they know, those ignorant Roman soldiers, when they did that? They just put that and they put the crowning at the proper day to be crowned, and then the kingdom can start. Without that, there will be no kingdom. So I finished the story, and the pastor says to me, I met, I met with him for lunch, and he says to me, so you got the story? I said, what do you mean I got the story? I told you the story. I said, did you get the whole thing? Said, I thought so. <clears throat> I said, yeah, what did you get? So now he's uh, the morning the rabbi reprimands me. Now the pastor that I teach him that stuff, he reprimands me. So what do you mean if I got the story? I got the story. I said, yeah, wh what did you get? So said, well, he was crowned. And then I said, no. What he was crowned with? I said, well, crown of thorns. Yeah, I told you that. I said, what does it mean to you? Crown of th means that they right to mock him and actually they blessed him. And what does it mean to you? I said, I don't know. And he says, what did he take away from earth when he was crucified? I said, the sin of man. That's what I was told by Frank. And, and he said, yes, and what else? I said, I don't know. And he says, who was punished there in the beginning of the Bible? It was what? And I said, ah, the earth was punished to grow thorns. And he says, now you understand the magnitude of what he took away from here, not just the sin of man. But he left here with a crown of thorns, which is the punishment and the sin of the earth. The symbol of the sin of the earth was also taken away from here at that moment. Is that powerful? It's amazing. So it's, it's so dramatic. Something about the question that you raised yesterday, Pastor Art. You, uh, we, we, I mean, the subject raises up everywhere. People talk about Kabbalah, Kabbalah, is that bad? And then people want to start checking it, entertaining it. Some are afraid. What? Oh, wow. Okay. So I just, I want to wrap up with this, you know. Um, Kabbalah, in my view, is not damaging, but on the other hand, it's not helping either. So it's mild. It has been... It has been used in a very horrible way in the past, misused, and that's why it received a bad name. It's really nothing so bad in Kabbalah. All it is is attempt of people. It's mysticism, true, but it, this, are, this is attempts of people to try to decipher secrets that are not for us, as we read here today. And they're trying to, to use numerics, not numerology, which is negative, numerics, which are numbers, and letters in Hebrew in order to see something behind it. Nice and sweet, as and they say in the 50s in, or 60s in America, dandy as well, except for it has no, nothing really good. Are we in Israel that we do Kabbalah, are we better than anybody else? No. Are we healthier? No. Are we, I don't know what, do we stop losing the hair because we're using Kabbalah? No. But I didn't use Kabbalah, who knows, you know. But, <laughs> It, did, did it get us anywhere? No. But there is the, the bad use of Kabbalah is what really awarded, quote, unquote, the bad name from Kabbalah. I can tell you exactly where it happened and how, and, and you, you'll understand it. And there is a concept among Jews. You probably heard it, Pastor, and you, other people probably did too. You are not, you're not supposed to touch Kabbalah before you reach the age of 40. You heard that? Or 35. When you reach that age, that's okay. Before that, don't touch it. 
What's the professional uh, scientific word I used yesterday? Baloney, that's the one. <laughs> Nothing to do with reality. Uh, they, say, they say it's going to distort your brain and it's going to make you crazy and it could make you nothing. They, they are referring to a misuse of Kabbalah that happened in a specific year. What year was that? I think 16, 1632, I think, 1630, 1632. A man appeared on the stage in Podolia, Poland, and it said, ladies and gentlemen, in a synagogue, in a big synagogue where the most Jewish population said, let me introduce myself. I am King Messiah. I came here for your salvation. And they were like, they were in big agony and pain during that time. Jews there, and they prayed for Messiah every day. And here he comes. I'm the Messiah. I'm here for your salvation. And they said, hallelujah, but can we see a positive ID? You know, I mean, some proof here. So no problem. He came equipped with a letter written by the biggest Kabbalist of the time. His name was the prophet Nathan from Gaza. That was the big city of Kabbalah at the time. And with a book of Kabbalah. And by looking at the acronyms, it's counting every 50th letter, it came out that it says they're in the Kabbalah. If you count the letters, his name was Shabtai Tzvi. Zvi. Shabtai Tzvi. And it says Shabtai Tzvi is Messiah for the salvation of Israel. Hallelujah. Everybody is propelled behind him. He is moving every, masses of people. Salvation is coming. Here we are. We got the salvation. Here is the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah that came to save us. But he gets propelled, and he needs to do some actions. He can't just look, okay, Messiah, no, show me the, where's the meat, where's the beef, right? So he moves on, and he goes to the man who really rules the land of Israel at that time, the Sultan in Kushta, which is later on Constantinopolis, which is today Istanbul, right, in Turkey. And this is the Sultan that rules the land. And he comes to him with a lot of Jews following him. This, he swept almost all Jews of Europe. Not everybody came, but they all knew the Messiah is here. Here's the Messiah. And he goes right there to the mosque in, uh, in Kushta, Constantinopolis, Istanbul, and he meets the Sultan. We don't have the recordings like we have the recordings of, uh, of today. No CDs left from that time, 1610, no, 1632. But there are documentation of what he said. He said something to the Sultan along these lines. Let my people go. Somebody said it before him, I think, right? No? Yeah, somebody. And the Sultan said to him, listen, we don't know exactly the wording, but something around those lines. Listen, buddy, I was deeply impressed by your presentation. But here are your two options. One, you convert to Islam before sunset. Convert to Islam. Two, I'm going to hang you on this beautiful tree right outside my palace before sunset. So make your choice. So what do you think? The Jewish Messiah is going to now take the choice of the tree. No, he took Islam. But that's a problem. You cannot convert out of Judaism. This is one of the four thing, three things that is death. You can't do that. How do you reconcile getting out, converting to Islam, and still be the Jewish Messiah? You like the job, but you need to convert. <laughs> he does. And converting is not like, I'm okay, Muslim, you know, put the tie. No, no, no. Gown. You can't hide being a Muslim. You need to bow down five times a day in the direction of Mecca, regardless of what time it is and where it is. You see people sometimes in the middle of the street. They do that. You know, you can catch them. You can't hide being a Muslim. You can hide being a Jew or something. Hey, two more minutes. I just need to finish it. So how, what, do you, what do you do? Here is the, the, the Messiah of the Jews getting out of the palace as a Muslim. Big problem, you know, and people are behind him. So now what they do, they go to the Talmud. I'll teach you in, one minute, in two minutes two principles of the, of the, of the, of the Kabbalah, two, the two main principles of the Kabbalah. They are very, very simplistic. One of them is called the theory of sparks. The other one is called the theory... What is the theory of sparks? The Nitzotzot. It talks about God being an entity of light that once was above, and then it spread... It's a good theory. And then it spread all over the world, to in, in forms of four, small sparks that symbolizes goodness, ethics, the wonderful thing in life, and they are buried under the dust, under the dirt, and it's all over around us. This is the entity of God all over. Theory number one. Theory number two, in order to bring this, to bring this goodness up to your life, you need to dig in the dirt to bring the spark up. That theory is called the departure of the righteous man. Stepping down to the mud, Digging there, picking up the spark and bring it up is the theory of the, of the departure of the righteous man. 
two theories in Kabbalah. Now he took that theory and he told the people outside, listen, what I did now converting to Islam means I followed the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah says this, that's what, exactly what I did. Digging in the dirt means doing the horrible things to Judaism. We start eating pigs now, we start doing that and atrocities of you name it. Any atrocity in the Bible and outside the Bible he did and all of them with him. And there are oh, public orgies with animals and all that, it's all documented. And this group, it's still there today. They're still doing some holidays, Passover in Turkey. It's called the Dunma, the Dunma, it's a sect. But by the time they understood, Jews understood that this, they've been deceived so badly and deceived by the use, misuse of Kabbalah, it was almost too late. And no parent will dare sending their children anymore to the synagogue. And Judaism was about to be extinct from the face of, the, of Europe, which means on the face of the earth almost. No parent will let the child go because look what they've done to their brains, capturing their brains and hearts with this Kabbalah stuff. And look, we're in shambles. So they kept them at home. The danger was that there was no rescue now because the, where are you going to study? No TV. I mean, how many people knew how to read? But a man came up right there, the Baal Shem Tov, the owner of the good name. And he come, that's when Hasidism came to the world as an antithesis to the false messiah movement and he said to people what's your problem you don't want to come to the synagogue stay home but re rejoice be happy let's celebrate to god in your backyard that's okay god is everywhere and that's how hasidism started um about the hebrew you, there is no i knew there is no way to finish that and i did not do it but if we were here again we'll do we talk about like a seminar of like a two or three days we're like six seven hours we go over anybody goes with the book there is a cd there you hear the sound Call me up. My, my number will be available at the office. Call me up anytime, evening time. I'm free, even later. It's okay. And I'll support people that study the Hebrew. We'll do it over the phone, and I'll give you cues. And even individually, I don't mind 50 phone calls. That's okay. Not in a day, but, you know, <laughs> two, three, five a day. That's okay. I, I, I'll do that because I want to continue. I, I knew I cannot cover the important parts and do that at the same time. I apologize for that. The two hours restriction was very tight here. If I did that, I could not cover the Messiah and we'll lose in that way too. So if you, and I recommend to everybody, please do it from your heart. Learn the Hebrew. The enlightenment that you get is enormous and immense. And even if you don't know the language, sometimes the Hebrew word will be on your heart. Call me up or don't call me up. Sleep on that for a few days and you'll see what kind of revelation will come straight to Sue your heart and your mind. I want to thank you for, so much for this wonderful hospitality and shalom, shalom. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. ben -Gigi. What an incredible night. Uh, a warm thank you for Dr. ben -Gigi. Do you think we might want to have him back for a two to three? How about a two to three week seminar? <laughs> well, thank you so much for being so patient and your good Talmudine. And that's uh, disciples and students. You all should be a part of a teshiva and, um, and part of shul as well. So good night, everyone. And uh, we will see you on Shabbat. God bless you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.